I see you found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world, and possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world. Each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning into this episode of The Oracles with James Tyson. Today, I am bringing in a friend of mine, Samantha Mowat. Very, very interesting young lady from here and living up in central British Columbia and has had the pleasure of being guided by various beings throughout her life. She is clairvoyant. She's a psychic. She does psychic readings and that side of her has opened up obviously through her life it's amazing that it's within the last several years that extraterrestrials and multi-dimensionals have come to be her primary focus she has met Andromedans, Arterians, black smoke entities, cone heads, crystal beings, golden energy beings, greys, hybrids, invisible beings, Lyrians, Mantis, uh, Palladians, Reptilians, all of the Reptilians, tan, green, gray, and black. Through her experiences, Samantha has found there to be a correlation between developing and maturing her own psychic abilities and the increased contact with these beings. In order to prove the validity of her energy work, um, the existence of energy beings such as angels, fairies, ETs, as well as parallel dimensions, past lives, and even life after death, science and metaphysical science need to be working hand in hand. Because really, they are two sources telling the exact same story, just from different perspectives. In our conversation today, we talk about being educated on craft. And if you are a experiencer, if you are a contactee, this may resonate with you being actually taken up onto a craft and going to school and being educated. And she was educated on craft off and on until she was in her early 20s. We talk about high vibration beings, light beings, crystal light beings, higher vibration humanoid beings like Palladians and low vibe like the black reptilian beings and the lower entities. We touch on star seeds, indigos, that kind of higher vibration uh, being. We talk about her experience with uh, what you almost describe men in black, these guys showing up and having a conversation with her. I can't remember if it was either on craft or off craft, but uh, her run in with people that were communicating her with her in black suits or dark suits telepathically. And we talk a little bit about all the diversity of life that is in the universe and her contact with them. Very, very interesting young lady. She is, as I say, uh, from central British Columbia, where she's kind of dug in and trying to stay off grid. Because as you can imagine, it gets a little bit overwhelming when every being in the universe wants to drop by for a coffee. She has a family up there, and she'd like to keep them away from all the naysayers and other things that are going on in society that is away from where her vibration is going. Again, she is on a website, samanthamowat.ca. She does clairvoyant readings, uh, psychic development training via YouTube. Again, you can go look her up on YouTube. And she does contactee guidance. So if you are a contactee, Samantha is definitely one that can walk you through and give you an idea of what you've experienced and what goes on from there. Let's welcome her in now, Samantha Mowat. Samantha, how are you? I'm great, James. How are you? I am well here on the lower left coast and you're way up in central British Columbia in the snow. Mm -hmm. For what, another six, six or seven months, you said? Um, possibly. The universe <laughs> keeps telling me that I'm moving at some point, so I'm kind of excited for that. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm really looking forward to our talk today. 
Me too. I haven't uh, had a chance to talk to you for a couple of years now. Uh, we were on Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, uh, probably about three or four years ago. And it was fascinating because I, I heard all about you. And uh, it was my first opportunity to actually having a chat with you about things. And my listener knows that you you are out there. You, you can be heard on a number of different podcasts. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, go to your website, samanthamowit.ca, and uh, find out all the things that you, they can find out all the things that you do through the website. And we're going to touch base on a few of those. But one of the things that I, I'm really interested in is your first contact, let's say, with extraterrestrials. Take my listener through that, Samantha, if you would. No problem, James. So for me, I have been someone who is very fortunate in the sense that I've had ET contact from the time I was in utero. I don't remember a lot of the stuff that happened in utero, but part of why I know I had contact during utero was when I got pregnant with my children. Um, I had ETs and multidimensionals and angelic beings coming to assist me with my pregnancies. And it was around that time that I realized, well, if it's happening with me with my current children, clearly this is something that's been going on for multiple generations. Now, my earliest recollection of having ET contact actually was shortly after I was born. It was in the 1980s. Um, It was kind of interesting in the sense that, well, I am a twin, and I'm a bit of an odd duck in the sense that I'm the twin that survived. My brother did not. And so um, when I was uh, this fresh little baby, I was so mad at him because he had made the choice to assist me from craft as an extraterrestrial and for me to stay down here because that would make it so that everything was better in his opinion. He perceived that it would make it so that our lives would be easier if I had more assistance on an ET level. And so one of my earliest memories is me being this angry, crying little baby, extremely frustrated. You know when babies cry to the point that their entire body goes red from screaming? Mm -hmm. It was like that. And my mom, I feel so bad for her when I look back on it now because she couldn't handle the crying baby. She put me down in the center of her bed, closed the door, and had to go walk away just to get a break. And I understand that. But she had no sooner closed the door and left the room to go into the living room that the energy started to shift in the room. Because I remember I was laying on my back and I remember my little eyes trying to look up towards the ceiling and everything being quite blurry after a couple of feet. Um, and this being came in with me. And at first I couldn't see it, but I could feel the vibrational resonance of this being as it came into the room. You know, when um, you know when an entity comes into the room, how you can kind of discern the vibrational frequency that it's emitting? Like an angelic being always feels very love-based, very kind. Then a deceased person, if it's a family member, you can recognize that feeling that the family member gave when you saw them. Well, it was kind of like that, except this time it was an ET being. And at first I couldn't quite see it because it was in between phase. So when something is in between phase, that means that it's operating just outside of the vibrational frequency or visible light that most people are able to perceive. And even as a small child, I was more clairvoyantly inclined. And so even though this being was cloaked, having an energy um, wrapped around it, so that if my mother opened the door, she would see like a bit of a hazy outline similar to that of like heat waves on a road in the hot summer, but she would still be able to see through. I was much closer to this being, and so I could see the outline of this beautiful Andromedan being. It had very large black almond-shaped eyes that were glossy. It was bending down to look at me. It had a very slender frame, a long neck, very delicate um, bone structure. When I looked at this being, it was singing to me telepathically. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because it was leaning over my teeny little body. And, you know, it was kind of fun because as he's looking at me and I'm looking at him, I remember just looking at his eyes and having the sense of calmness. You know, he was like... (sighs) It was kind of like that kind of crying sound that started to come over me because he was calming down the energy that was being emitted. And he assured me that everything was going to be all right. I was so angry because I had gone from somewhere where my body felt very comfortable to being this dense, um, intense energy planet and my lungs were burning. So my parents smoked in the house like a lot of people did in the 80s. I was very mad about that. I was saying, nope, take me home. I don't want to do this. I'm not doing this contract. I'm done. And this being had essentially come up to me to heal the lungs. And so he placed his finger, or was it two fingers? I'm not positive. One or two fingers gently down on my chest. My guys keep saying it's one, so it must have been one. 
And as he does so, these beautiful waves of energy are just flowing out of his body, down through his arm, into his hand, and into my chest. And as this energy starts to fill up my body, it fills me with this sense of love and comfort and a feeling of safety. And it took away a lot of the pain that I was feeling in my chest, and it started to sing to me in an ET dialect. Now, the funny thing that a lot of people don't understand about ET dialects is their words aren't necessarily similar to ours. A lot of their um, communication is done in blocks of information. So imagine if I were to take a movie that you've never seen before and put the entire movie into your head. It was very similar to having that kind of experience done, yet feeling the effects of it lasting for quite a long period of time. And so when he was singing to me, um, it slowly put my little body to sleep. And even though I was feeling abandoned by my twin brother, I felt as though... (sighs) Something in my heart knew that it was all right and that these beings were going to protect me and keep me safe and heal my body whenever it had issue, like issues going on. And so I don't remember this being leaving, but I do remember my eyes growing very, very heavy and falling asleep. And that was something they did quite a bit for me as I was growing up, was coming in to heal me. Now, it seems to go in waves when it comes to my ET contact. I'll go through periods where I see Andromedans quite a bit. Then I'll go through another period where I see humanoids quite a bit. In a different period where I'll see reptilians quite a bit. It really depends on what's going on in my life. Because the vibrational frequency that I'm emitting better determines who it is that's interacting with me. Do you want me to just segue into another encounter I remember from my childhood? Or would you like to interject? I I would like to ask a couple of questions. Just about what you just said there about Mm -hmm. how different uh, ET beings come in. Uh, at different portions of times in your life or where you were going through a, a, a specific vibration mm-hmm. or um, a resonance. Um, mm-hmm. uh, are, which, which would be the ones that come in when you were um, on a, a really positive, uh, when you're on, <laughs> on a life high? So if I'm going through a wonderful energetic period, like let's say I'm not having any my lab encounters, I'm not going through anything related to MK Ultra, I'm not going through anything um, really dense and hard on the body, and nothing in my normal day-to-day life, like nothing like, if you're going through something like a divorce, death of a family member, um, intense mood, extreme stress, you're not going to have a lot of higher vibrational beings come to see you to a large capacity. You might see them once but you're not going to see them frequently. But when I'm in a high vibrational state, I have light beings coming to see me, crystalline beings, angelic beings, flower beings, um, which are a form of elemental and crystalline type energy. The higher vibrational humanoids do come to see me who are um, very similar to us, but they don't have the same pollutant levels. It's almost like their technology is much more ahead of ours, and they tend to not want to deal with the humans that have a lot of their garbage coming forward. They want to deal with the ones who are working on their soul evolution and growth. And so when I've been in those periods of intense learning and wanting to really better myself and like um, clearing my karma, clearing a lot of the energies that were holding me back in the programming, then I have the higher vibrational Pleiadians and humanoids come to see me. It's It really depends on what I'm going through as to who is coming in most frequently. Well, do you find uh, certain ones come through when you're in, in a really low state? Like, uh, and mm-hmm. if so, who are they? Yeah, actually, I have been making notes and patterns trying to figure out exactly what the system in place is. Now, some of the reptilians, not all of them, because some of the reptilians are very high vibrational, very loving, wonderful beings. But um, some of the black reptilians I've had problems with because I'll get into um, periods where I have really intense negative hybridization experiences or I'll have negative myelab experiences, and that can put me into a bit of a depression. And so either when I'm astral projecting or even physical, like having physical encounters, I'll have some of the negative reptilians or I'll have some of the negative grays coming forward or I'll have um, more things like Dijin coming around or um, lower vibrational entities like um, how can I explain this you know when you have um, like you forgot to put up your energy protection for a couple weeks you're just really feeling off and then you start to notice a lot of spirits coming around who are just messing with your house messing with your technology stuff like that I notice things like that happen as well if I'm in a lower dimension or lower vibrational state do you think the people that um, are, don't have the vibration that you have uh, don't operate or don't live with what you have to live with? Um, it, it, a good chunk of the population out here do not, you know, clean your house, do not um, mm-hmm. fix things or work on the energy in their house and the protection of their house. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think their houses are just filled with these kind of things dragging them down, or do they really only key on the higher vibration people? Well, I think that because the amount of humanity that is waking up, it's actually increasing the vibrational range in which most people are exposed to on a day-to-day basis. If we were to compare, say, the 1950s, where someone were to be born in one vibration and probably not grow much further than the vibration they're born at, that's a very small window for entities that would come to see them. So they may not have frequent encounters with these different types of beings. Whereas if we look at the last 20 or 30 years, it's very clear that humanity is going through an awakening and that the amount of people incarnating even upon the planet are naturally coming in with a higher range of frequencies that they're able to access. And these people who are born with the natural um, frequency um, of beings they can access tend to have more different types of beings come to see them. If we look at, for instance, I'll circle around your question in a moment, but this interrelates to it, I promise. Um, If we look at the children that are born, say, in the 1950s compared to the children in the 60s versus the 80s versus the 2000s versus 2010, 2020, we can see that there's these huge leaps or jumps going on. And each generation seems to be more psychic than the last one. And because of that, these beings um, are, some of them are soul family coming in to assist. So if you are a star seed, you're going to have the various um, soul beings that you work with. Like let's say you're from the Orion system. You will obviously have Orion beings come to see you. But because of that contact of these Orion beings come to see you, you may have some of the negative entities and negative dimensional beings who are like, oh, I see a beacon of light coming from that house. And it's from this child. I never felt the need to go to that house in San Francisco before. And I've been in this area for a couple hundred years. Why is there this pillar of light starting to come out? And it turns out it's this new person or this person going through an awakening process. And so they will start tuning in to go see what this light is, what this new vibration is. A lot of people do have beings that pass through their home quite frequently. But as to whether these beings are choosing to stop, interact with the person, mess with the person, or even try to attach onto their auric system is another matter. So it's a little more complicated, I think, than people initially perceive. It's a very... Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's incredibly more complicated. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Yeah, it it is amazing. um, And it's amazing that you have, through through your life, um, your short life, actually, Mm because you're an 80s kid and I'm one of those 50s kids, Mm -hmm. um, that you've actually have the gift or, or have had the time to go through and kind of start putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And, and seeing it, and um, and of course, it's, it's the, I'm sure the puzzle is growing, and you're getting new pieces every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it's to look to look at that through your eyes is is actually quite fascinating, Samantha. Thanks, James. Um, the reason why I have to look at this puzzle and these pieces is one because it's part of my life's agreement. I've agreed to make um, extraterrestrials, multidimensionals, and psychic abilities more of a normal facet for humanity. But also because the amount of encounters that I have. It, you get to a point when you have encounters, whether it's astral, physical, psychic, um, even energetic, where you're like, I need to figure out what's going on here. I need to understand why at some periods I'm bombarded with these type of encounters and these beings, whereas other times I've got these guys coming around. And so it's through my own investigation upon my own experiences and the experiences of my family members, both close family and extended family, that has allowed for me to really gain this kind of awareness. Well, you're... you're your gift or your your path you say um Mm -hmm. is to to kind of help uh weave into i shouldn't say weave in i'm putting words (laughs) in your mouth that's okay introduce us to the kind of understanding of an extraterrestrial presence a multi-dimensional and and then grow other people's psychic abilities Mm -hmm. probably which will help them understand the whole et and multi-dimensional thing um what is the difference between multi multi multi-dimensionals and extraterrestrials So an extraterrestrial being is often misinterpreted. So when people think of an extraterrestrial, they think of um, all the different beings from the reptilians to the reptilians to the coneheads to the angelic beings to the greys, the hybrids, the mantis, you name it. When in actuality, most of these beings are multidimensional. An extraterrestrial comes from this dimension, this frequency, but from a different planet or solar system 
or a galaxy, where, and that would mean they're in our universe. Whereas the multidimensional beings, which is what actually the majority of these beings actually are, are coming from a different vibrational state, so a different dimension, a different universe, and they could be from anywhere in that universe, but they use um, a form of technology that doesn't cover just distance, it creates other wormholes or gateways between one dimension and the next. If we were to think of um, the greys, and we think, okay, well, the greys are from the Orion system, we have to take into consideration how long it would take for them to get from the Orion system to here, based upon their technology, when in actuality, most of these beings tend to have technology that takes them from one dimension to another, it kind of bends time and space in a way that we don't fully understand. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, from the UK, Steve Mara, who mm-hmm. uh, he and his uh, research partner are doing something called Project Doorway. Nice. And what they're doing is they're actually studying the idea, as you say, an extraterrestrial going from the Orion belt to here mm-hmm. uh, through their technology You know, in a, in a craft will take X amount of time, depending mm-hmm. on how fast they can get going where Mm -hmm. he believes more is moving through um the the vibrational resonances or the gravitational um Mm -hmm. anomalies is i think more what he puts them as opposed to a a, a wormhole or a portal the the late the term for me is portal they come through Mm -hmm. portals um but you're saying that those type those multi-dimensionals aren't what we would if we had a picture of an, uh, a multi-dimensional, it wouldn't look like a gray, or it wouldn't look like a. a not, mimic. not quite. Um, I think we're having some miscommunication. Okay. What? That's it's cool. I'm totally glad you asked this because it's always good to verify. They can still look like grays or Nordics or reptilians or whatever. But what I'm saying is that they're just not from our universe. A lot of these are actually from a different universe that's close in frequency, typically, to ours, within a certain range that they can handle being in ours for at least a short period of time before they have to go to a vibration that's more compatible for their true form. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Now I'm with you. So Perfect. it's just a different, uh, it, it is a different vibration, a uh, being of a different vibration mm-hmm. and using uh, that um, gravitational uh, anomaly to travel and mm-hmm. coming here for what reason why 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 are they all coming here <laughs> well um there's a number of reasons i mean there's so many reasons actually some are here for um helping of humanity because some of them look at us and they're like okay well we're going to help all the different species around the universe they're going through the awakening process and they look at it because for some of them they're healing their own karma they're helping to make it so that because they haven't necessarily done good things to others in the past like towards us for instance some of them help to see humanity some of them are here because of hybridization so the act of the mixing and creating of new species or a developed or changed species. Um, so there's that aspect. Some are here for the meat markets because humans are a resource just like cattle for some beings. Um, some of them are here for um, the evolution of their own consciousness and the expansion of that. So they're looking, like, look at some of the mantis beings. A lot of them are connecting with humanity. One, because they do have um, some of their soul family incarnating as humans currently, but also because they're wanting to understand the complex emotional range that humans are emitting. Because emotions are actually a very um, evolved and connected form. So when you actually are able to harness your emotions and harness that energy, you can use it for the creation. You can use it for manifestation. You can use it for um, as weaponry. There's all sorts of things you can use that emotional energy for. It's just a matter of being able to tap into that vibrational frequency. A lot of the gray beings are here because they're um, looking to expand the their own um, species. They've actually cut emotions out, which has become a bit of a detrimental state for them. And so they're actually rebreeding with humanity, trying to create the right like mixture of gray human and other beings to try to actually re-improve their, um, their own species on their evolutionary path because it made it very difficult for them to breed very in a healthy fashion. Oh, so, Lord. And some of the other beings do view us as food, unfortunately. So, I mean, it is very complex when we talk about the reason why these beings are coming here. Okay, now you've got me with that whole meat market and viewing us as food thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Would they just come in and take a bunch of us out of a bus and move us off and eat us, or do they take us for breeding for food? Mm, depends on the group. Some of the reptilians that I've been in contact with have showed that their intentions are to come down here and take as much of humanity as they possibly can and sell them into meat markets. Some of them show they'll pick people off one by one, people that are hitchhiking, people that are not necessarily going to be missed, that are walking alone or in small groups camping in the woods. They show all sorts of things like that to me. And I've been trying to discern whether that is a fear tactic that they're attempting to show me or if it's a sign of respect and trying to show me these things because they're trying to educate me about the matter. I'm uncertain as to which it is, but that is something they have expressed on numerous occasions with various colors of reptilians. See, and that that's a challenge that I would give them too because if they actually have meat markets somewhere and mm -hmm. are taking people to fill the meat markets from Earth. Not just Earth, uh, but yes. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, they'd have to get them from somewhere else, too, because uh, there's not enough of us going missing <laughs> daily to help out. <laughs> for, for um, you know, to, to kind of uh, soothe that appetite. Uh, for the, if the and, you know, I, I'm thinking of a reptilian being something, uh, and I'm, I'm obviously thinking the, the biggest, strongest ones that would need to eat. Uh, one and a half people a day, <laughs> so <laughs> depending on how many of them there are. Uh, but, getting, into, getting into that negative side of ETs, mm -hmm. and um, now kind of falling back on my lab, mm -hmm. the military kind of coming in and saying, okay, I, you, you saying I've been abducted or I had an ET contact and the military coming in and basically wanting to interrogate you on who did it. Um, that kind of kind of kind of overlaps on there are negative ones out there, and we're trying to get more information on the ones that are having communication with everybody just to see, okay, what did they ask you? What did you see? What are they talking about? What information did you get? Is that what you're kind of getting from the my lab side of things? My, my lab situations tend, tend to be a bit more complicated than that of the standard person because quite often I'll get put in either training ops, teaching positions. Um, I've been in my lab since I was a child. And so when I was younger in elementary school, I was put through a lot of ops where it was training ops, learning about weaponry, learning how to use energy, learning how to discern what position your enemy is coming from stuff like that. So quite often when I'm encountering my my lab handlers now, they're not needing to be sitting me across from the table going, Smith, what did you see? Tell us everything. Instead, they will sit down across me and be like, and they will use what is one of my trigger names. And so quite often for those of us who are my labs, we actually have fragmented aspects or fragmented personalities because we do have a certain degree of mind control. It is beaten into you from a very young age and your mind is split. Anyone who is a MyLab will have a lot of programming in them. And so I will have one sit across me. Quite often it will be either a woman or this one particular man that I've seen for years. And she'll be sitting across a table from me. It's a very stark room. It's fairly bright. There will normally be a soldier that's standing in the corner who doesn't speak, but he's looking at me the whole time. And it will be very calm and simple like you and I are chatting right now. She'll ask me, who have you seen lately? What did they show you? Where are they from? What did you do? Were you on planet? Were you off planet? What kind of craft was it? It is not necessarily always interrogation in the way that people are perceiving it. Mm -hmm. But that is also because I am, like I am bloodline. I am someone who comes from a military family. I was born on a military base. I was born to parents in the military. And it's there's different components you have to take into consideration when you are talking to my labs because there's a whole different range of what is encompassed under the my lab aspect. And so when I am encountering my my lab handlers, sometimes I will encounter my lab handlers and I'll have reptilians that are telling the my lab um, personnel what to do. And the my lab personnel don't often look at the reptilians. They will look to the floor. They will look off to the side, but they will not typically make eye contact because they don't have the ranking and position to do so. And so uh, it's different than what people are typically perceiving. It really is. It's not well talked about on YouTube or on most platforms because it's a very dangerous thing for anyone to cover. Oh, great. So now We're this fine. recording is going to go away, <laughs> uh, which has happened before. I had I a, a very interesting event uh, with a, uh, in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. uh, where a uh, gentleman who had got some photographic evidence from an ET mm -hmm. and had a bunch of time missing. 
and mm-hmm. he was in our booth and he was getting a regression done. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of the regression, the psychic ended up going into a seizure. Oh. When she came out of the seizure, well, we had to do some squeeze nerve points and stuff on our, our shoulders and her arm or something to get her out. Mm-hmm. Um, but she she came out of the seizure and she said, yeah, that that's, was creepy because we had an ET step in basically saying, stop, you can't do this. Mm-hmm. And then another ET came in and saying, you have to leave her alone. Mm-hmm. It, it's not your space. You're not your place. So the two arguing ETs, a, a lower vibe one came in and affected her, basically put her into the seizure wall. And then she actually saw the higher vibe one come in and say, no, you can't leave her alone. <laughs> He can he can know this stuff. So mm-hmm. I interviewed him right after, and his, he was just bubbly. He was uh, amazed at all the information that he could remember <laughs> now. The, and we were watching the little meter on the recorder going. Yeah. It's fine. Nothing showed up on the recording. Oh, I hate that. I've had YouTube videos do that where I'll be sitting in my reading room making a YouTube video, and I'll go look at it after. I'm like, why is there no sound? Why is there no picture? Why is everything not working? It just keep, depends on what you're talking about. I keep looking at the meter here to make sure, yeah, both of our meters are going. So <laughs> we should have both sides of the conversation. Sometimes I only get one side. I only get my side of the conversation. Mm. And it's always ET people. There was a fellow down in Mississippi. I've still got to call him back because uh, mm. we did this before the new year. Mm-hmm. Um, ET, uh, you know, abduction back in the 70s uh, on the riverbank in in, uh, in Mississippi, uh, down in Mississippi. <laughs> and he... And the entire conversation uh, was only my side of the conversation. It's like, damn it. <laughs> Quit that. Oh, no. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was very, very interesting. We're talking to Samantha Mowat. Please go to her website, Samantha Mowat. That's M-O-W-A-T, SamanthaMowat.ca. Samantha not only is an experiencer and has been, obviously, uh, for many, many many years okay, <laughs> um, That's all good. She, she also gives you if you are a contactee uh, she provides uh, some guidance for that she is a uh, person to psychic development training uh, she can get a, a clairvoyant reading too from her mm-hmm. and uh, a lot more um, yeah Samantha and if you uh, you do this via Skype do you um, I do some of it on Skype. I prefer the phone because I find quite often for some reason when I do sessions on Skype, my internet drops and I can't connect, in which case I have to call them on the phone anyway. But if people are wanting to get more information about extraterrestrials, multidimensionals, their psychic abilities, how to connect with their guides and psychic development, I do provide a lot of it for free on my YouTube channel. Just type in Samantha Mo, it'll take you right there. It's just they do want me to release a lot of information about how people can expand their own gifts. And I really don't. I'm not necessarily a big fan of having to teach people one-on-one because I don't like for them having to pay for my time. I like for everyone to get as much for free as possible. Uh, Yeah, me too. And people Mm -hmm. were always saying, well, you're doing um, psychic readings for people. Uh, You should charge them. And I said, well, okay. And I started charging them. It was $36 a year. (laughs) So what it was is that if you liked it, you'd go to my Patreon account, which supports the podcast, Mm -hmm. and sign up for $3 a month. Nice. I love that. And that was it. And that also got you into a draw every month for a psychic reading, a past life regression, or an astrological chart. That's perfect. I love that. And if I finally, someday, ever get my 2,222 people, Uh I'll be drawing once a month, and you'll get a trip for two. Awesome. Why not? To a, you know, check off your... Um, metaphysical, um, parapsychological bucket list. If you like ghosts, we'll go to Gettysburg or the Queen Mary or any of those other woo-woo places that you've seen on TV. <laughs> and we'll actually do a investigation with a local team. And I, I have a uh, documentary film fellow here. We'll come down and film it uh, for YouTube and you'll get your own documentary. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's the plan. And if you like UFOs, I'll send you to UFO conferences, the VIP package, hotel, accommodation, airfare, the whole bit. Because I am retired and I really don't need a ton of money coming in. But I want to just keep giving it away and having people experience stuff. Mm-hmm. Which would be just so much fun. Plus, I get to go with them. So I get to travel, too. <laughs> excuse to get out. Why not? We'll exactly. take it. Exactly. Uh, perfect excuse to get out um you we i remember talking to you uh, a few years back and i was mm-hmm. absolutely amazed at your conversation you kind of brought up uh that you had had an experience with the men in black mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that actually no tell us everything about that <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my God. So I've encountered a lot of different types of people in my experiences. Um, some of which are a little more complicated than people understand. So when we look at men in black, it's, I've realized now that these were an aspect of a different branch of my my lab situations. Um, how can I explain this nicely? Oh my God. Sorry, I was prepared for kid stuff. So I thought about in the last hour before you and I started speaking, it's all my childhood encounters. But, oh, um, we'll get back to that. <laughs> it's all good. I just, the men in black thing just came into my head again. <laughs> That's okay. So one thing that I noticed when it comes to this aspect was this was a couple of years ago. Um, I found myself in my home. I interestingly enough was having what I thought was dinner with my family. And all of a sudden we heard what sounded like a helicopter over our house. I've been trying to figure out if this was, I'm pretty sure this was a physical encounter. And what happened was I had these two guys that pulled up in a van in our driveway. It was a completely unmarked van. It was white. I remember being walking walked out with my family and what's interesting is my German Shepherd who would have been only like one or two at the time um, she didn't bark she just laid down I don't know that's completely unlike this dog I mean I've got way too many YouTube videos out there where my dog's going nuts over next to nothing so clearly they did something to make it so the dog fell asleep and I suspect it came from that helicopter um, the next thing I recall about the situation was these men had taken us to this oh, next I don't remember the drive I don't remember how long we were gone, but I do remember being put in a room. And this was one of the few times where I can remember being interrogated by a man who was wearing a suit. Now, the men that were in this room, they were interesting. So I had but one of the men who's known as what well, I call him the general because he's not a large man. Um, he's maybe only like five, eight, five, nine. Like he doesn't look terribly bigger than me. Um, he does have short hair. He does typically wear almost like this off green type of suit he looks like he's in his 60s and I remember seeing him in this encounter and this was before I ended up going into this room he was the one that walked me into this room and sat me down and I do remember this man coming in afterwards who was wearing a black suit um, typically when you see like in, when you're in a my lab encounter you will see a couple different types of uniforms you will see military uniforms that don't typically have um, badges they don't typically have insignia they don't typically have like saying uh, P. Andrews. they won't have anything like that like a little name tag like I remember my parents having when I was a kid they won't look necessarily as typical as what you'd expect Sorry, I'm trying to remember every detail to help you when it comes to this. Um, he did bring me into a small room, and this was one of the few instances where I remember having him standing directly in front of me, just staring at me while this other man came in. The man that came in gave me the creeps. Um, the thing that I find really interesting about this encounter is he came in, he was very, very pale. He was not wearing, he wasn't wearing military type clothes. He wasn't wearing tactical gear. He wasn't wearing, like when you see ETs quite often, they'll be wearing this outfit where roughly only their hands and their neck and head are exposed, but the rest of their bodies being covered. He wasn't wearing something like that. He was wearing a very nondescript suit. And I remember this man at one point standing in front of me, and I believe he sat down in front of me. And when he was speaking to me, it was all telepathic. None of it was verbal. And it was almost like he was pulling information out of my head rather than actually directly asking me the questions. That is part of the experience that I have with that. Um, the thing that I did notice about this experience that I really did not like was when I went home, I had anxiety attacks for two weeks because I just couldn't handle the energy of what was around like that situation. So that is the main thing I remember about that encounter. The man, I can't remember his face. I remember him having exceptionally light skin. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't like albino white. It was closer to like a porcelain or ivory cover, um, like color. So very light, um, not quite as light as snow type thing, but not really far off. Enough that he looked quite pale though. Um, I do remember him having almost like either a dark hat on or dark hair. I can't remember which because it's almost like my vision. You know when your vision goes out of focus mm -hmm. and you just can't refocus it? It was like that, which is quite odd for someone like me um, because as someone who's clairvoyant, I'm always looking at, okay, well, what colors are coming out of somebody? What kind of energy are they having come through? And this man felt void of energy. He felt like all the life had been sucked out of him, if that makes any sense. Almost like he didn't have a true vibrational signature. Interesting. Is, it the, is he the first person you've ever met that uh, was like that? 
Yeah, he is. Oh, wow. Did you ever um, mm -hmm. have an experience with that type of thing at a bus stop in Vancouver? Nope. Because I don't take buses in Vancouver. I'll take a SkyTrain, but not buses. Oh, okay. No, I, th I can't remember. If I thought I maybe was talking to you about um, an experience with uh, some men in black at a, uh, at a on a bench or something in Vancouver at one point. Um, like a couple of years ago, not where the conversation was a couple of years ago. That's why it's so fuzzy. In my head. And it's <laughs> That's okay. not that I don't talk to a lot of people in between that. You do. <laughs> and there's but... a bunch in there. Um, going back to mm -hmm. your experiences as a, as a teenager now, mm -hmm. we kind of going up. Oh, and as a child, did you learn light language? I know it's a weird question, but I had to ask. To the best uh, of my knowledge, no. Um, okay. Most of the communication that they've done with me has been telepathic from a very young age. And so they don't tend to use dialects with me as often. Okay. Because a friend of mine uh, in Australia, she has had ET uh, contact ever since she was in the crib. And, nice. Um, that's where they taught her this weird language. And a, her name is uh, Soretta Anteria, and she lives Ooh. in Melbourne. And the uh, Japanese film crew, a documentary came, picked her up and took nice. her to Italy. Ah. and uh, put her with a lady in Italy who spoke light language in Italian and stuck them both in a room and they spoke light language and they pulled them apart and interviewed them and sure enough, they, yeah, they were talking about the same <laughs> thing but neither of them spoke each other's first language so I love it's that. always been fascinating too that this light language thing has been incredible and that's where she learned it I mean, she can, she's probably like you you could stand, well, I don't know I'm not going to put words in your mouth but she can stand out on a hill mm -hmm. and call UFOs in. Well, well normally, and, and so other people can see them, and then they <laughs> leave. I love that. Um, normally, if I go hiking in the woods or if we're going camping, like when we went up to the Yukon, we saw a whole bunch of them type thing, which is fine. But if I'm going somewhere out in the woods where there's not tons of people, normally I end up seeing either beings peeking around trees or I'll have them come up to me or I'll have UFOs in the sky. That's completely normal when it comes to contactees and abductees. It's just part of what we go through. That's so cool. I've got a, a, a peeking around the tree thing. I And um, years ago, we had a uh, availability. Uh, like, you, you speak to your spirit guides, right? Mm -hmm. You have guides with you? Yes. Um, about in 2014, 2015, a lot of those guides in psychics from around the world took a step back. Mm -hmm. And when E.T. came in mm -hmm. and took over. And it was a specific time period for about a year. Mm -hmm. And you had a choice. If When they showed up, you could say yes or no. But most people just accepted it, that this mm -hmm. was a new guide. Mm -hmm. And it just happened to be E.T. Well, we had the opportunity to sit and talk to one and ask. The, we called him Rob. <laughs> and he, <laughs> and uh, got some information on basically ask him anything except anything to do with um, conspiracies like 9-11 and JFK and all that stuff. That's it's, fair. I did slip in a couple of JFK things, um, <laughs> and I got shut down. Um, but uh, he was talking about the uh, Bigfoot. Now, mm -hmm. you're a central British Columbian. You're a, uh, a British mm -hmm. Columbian Pacific Northwest kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sasquatch is, you know. In our backyard. Uh, is, is literally <laughs> in our backyard. And um, if, if you could get them to clean the gutters, that's even greater <laughs> because they're tall. But the, um, uh, we got into a, a, an alien being called the Echo. E K K O. Mm -hmm. um, this is basically a being that uh, I, I was told is the one, the Bigfoot. We see the Sasquatch. We see peeking around a tree, and then when you go around the tree, it's gone. And it's doing that while the real critter family is mm -hmm. booking it over the hill. Uh, behind you. <laughs> behind me. So it's like going, hey, look over here. And while, because it's it's protecting that other being. Is that... Any, does that resonate with you at all in your experiences? Yes, it does. It resonates quite well. Um, one thing I've found when you do tend to go out in the woods is you'll end up, if you're someone who does encounter a lot of multidimensional beings, if you have like an elemental ahead of you, it could be getting your attention over here. So that something else could be moving over there. Or you might notice that, hey, look, that squirrel looks like it's chittering away. Like it's looking at me, like it's talking to me. It's getting my attention. And meanwhile, you could have something like a fawn walking behind you. Not like a human, or not, pardon me, human fawn, not like a deer fawn, but like a fawn more of like the 
the small beings that tend to have like the fairy, like the um, furry legs and the more of a bipedal form, it's because the, um, from what they've explained to me at least, the dimensions seem to be blending as Earth is readjusting to a new vibration. And so a lot of these beings are becoming into our like physical sight, something we're seeing with our eyes rather than just our third eyes. So it's, wow. it's almost like we're shifting. Interesting. I, I remember uh, telling people this, um, well, I, as soon as I got into the quote unquote woo woo community, mm-hmm. the, um, I, my hindsight kind of opened up a lot looking back, especially dealing with a psychic who pointed at all this stuff in my past that no, I had never told anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I, in the mid sixties as a little, little kid, mm-hmm. I saw a gnome, like a garden Aww. gnome. Nice. Like, like with the red hat and the white beard and the blue coat, the whole bit. Like if you had a have a stereotypical <laughs> one, and it was in the grass where the horse would stick its head through the fence, eating the grass on the outside of the fence. There's mm-hmm. there was a, a area cleared about two feet wide, two th- yeah about two feet wide, and then there was higher taller grass, maybe a foot eight <laughs> inches to a foot and higher. Yeah, and this thing was on the edge of the grass, looking at the horses. I love that. I was, I was looking at it thinking, oh, I wonder why someone's put a garden home there. So I jumped this little ditch. I concentrated on the j- ditch. I jumped it because I wanted to go pet the horses, mm-hmm. which didn't turn out well. But um, <laughs> the um, so I'm walking along, and I walked up to where the gnome was, and there was nothing there. <laughs> and I, I looked at that gnome <laughs> for about 10 minutes and thought, okay, that's weird. I saw. I definitely saw a gnome. <laughs> and But, you know, as a little kid back in the mid-60s, you know, you know, I, Obviously, I wasn't thinking of, of gnomes being real. Of course not. <laughs> what the heck did I just see? But, uh, yeah, that was kind of awkward. Now, again, hindsight, because I, I can, and it, it's one of those memories I have that I can pull back. I mm-hmm. Imagine uh, all the hundreds, well, the 365 days a year of memories you have through mm-hmm. decades. Mm-hmm. And that memory is one that is like in in the Rolodex that pops up. I can I can picture the whole thing in my head, and it wasn't a story that I repeated over and over and over and over again to imprint that no. memory. But it is a very very vivid memory, and it was funny because until lately, well, that memory was me going to pet horses. <laughs> and oh yeah, by the way, there was a, a a gnome, but now it's the gnome is the memory more than the horses were. It's weird. It's it's like that that has been it, a switch came on. To say, hey, just so you know, you you did see something, and uh, there's a reason you saw it at that time, and we're giving, we're letting you now peek into all the things that you've come come through in your life mm-hmm. that add up to where you are now. Does that make sense? That makes complete sense to me. Actually, what I was thinking when you're talking about it is how amazing that with your awakening process and how you're really starting to um, release those almost like um, memories that were in your subconscious mind are coming to the surface to a much greater extent. It'd be fascinating if you write that one down, how many more come up to the surface now that that one's been allowed to um, really come into your conscious mind, how many more you've suppressed. Probably just the scary ones. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm hoping it's the nice ones. Because I mean, do you know what? When I was a kid, there were a couple sections where I didn't remember some of my nice ET encounters because some of the scary ones stood out a lot more than some of the nice ones. And as I started to get into things like yoga and meditation in my teenagehood, it really helped me to remember some of my other encounters, which made life a lot better because then I remembered, oh, goodness, okay, so um, yes, I may have seen these scary guys, but I've also still got these really nice things coming to see me too. And so remembering the support system. Yeah, the other thing too is is well, you you're a little bit different. You're a lot of bit different uh, mm-hmm. because your memory goes back um, <laughs> uh, quite young within the womb. Uh, the um, but for people who are kind of awakening in their teens and twenties mm-hmm. and pulling stuff out of their memory, yes, the, um, the scary stuff comes out boils comes to the top first because that is that is fear based. Therefore, it is. Um, are, are kind of that primal life and death. We have to know this is bad in mm-hmm. case it comes again and it could hurt us. So mm-hmm. all the fluffy stuff gets pushed away. And we take the scary stuff and we put that into our quiver of learning. So we carry that with us a lot more. And it, sh- it certainly overwhelms all the fluffy stuff. And it's, like, it's going to the fair mm-hmm. and having a wonderful day. But as you left, there was an accident on the road. And when you think about the day you spent at the fair, well, I remember that bad accident on the way home. 
But all the fluffy, nice smiles and laughter is blurred because the uh, the injury or the life and death situation is what you came away with. Well, James, for people like your audience who are going through the awakening process, I would love it if they would just, you know, go to the store, buy a journal. It doesn't have to be something fancy, just any journal. And what my guides had me do years ago, and they've recommended this to countless clients, is to write down every single experience that you had that stands out in your mind. So if you remember one time when you were a kid waking up and thinking that there was a being at the foot of your bed, but you can't remember seeing it, but you swear you felt something or you knew something was there, write that down. If you have periods of missing time write that down if you woke up and or you had a premonition where you dreamt that you were going to see a car accident or you dreamt that your friend was going to have something happen or a family member and then it came true later write that down every time you accept something that you've either seen and suppressed or intuitively knew you allow for yourself to access greater amounts of your experiences and your knowledge things that you have tucked away into sections of your mind that are currently being repressed and you're allowing that to come to the surface what the this does is when you encounter things from that point onwards, you have better memory retention, but you also allow yourself to have greater control when you encounter them. So if, for instance, um, by doing this, you allow yourself to recognize, okay, I do have some intuitive gifts. Great. Okay. So I have talked using my mind before with some of these beings. When you encounter a being in the future, be it in your astral state or in your physical state, you are better able to handle that situation and have more control within it, better deciding what you do and how you choose to react, which is a much better place of awareness to be coming from than purely from that, oh my goodness, I have no control on the deer in the headlights. So wow. it really does help you in a lot of ways. That's fascinating. I, 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 I'm always big on pushing journals. I mm -hmm. have one. I carry it with me. When I was doing paranormal investigations, that was like mm -hmm. I didn't talk most of the time mm -hmm. and try to shush everybody else up. But I, I would just make notes and, and draw pictures of what I was getting at the time. And I always really suggest that for anybody who um, is very conscious of being active within a dream mm. is to get up and just write uh, the next day, at least and, even just point form on what you did in your dream. Of course. I mean, that's beautiful. And from point form, expand upon it. So, mm -hmm. you know, go through the basic things that police officers do when they're investigating who, where, what, why, when, what was the weather, you name it. Every detail you can possibly think of, write it down because it all is giving you clues and reference points for your memory to extract further information at a later date. Yeah, and, and as my drill corporal used to say, it's the little things. <laughs> so <laughs> don't think just because it was a small little thing that you experienced that it, it's um, not important. It's the little things that eventually it's every one of those is a, pe a piece of a larger puzzle. I agree. And just keep, you know, make note of them. And uh, you'll find that the, as they repeat over and over, you're going, oh, that's not as little as I thought it was. <laughs> I keep seeing that large hairy thing in the bush or <laughs> you know, there's I, I smell roses in my bedroom sometimes. You know that those kind of things. Um, you you talk about in in one of your um, actually in your biography that mm -hmm. you had a uh, you have a way to um, manipulate energy a little bit, yeah, to read it and to use it um, obviously for good. Um, how do you first of all? How did you discover energy and what is the energy you're talking about? So how I came to learn about energy or quote unquote discover it was when I was a teenager, I was going to school on craft and I was going at least a couple times a month and I was always taken by the same humanoid beings. At the time, I didn't realize they were Pleiadians. I didn't realize that these humans were from somewhere else. I had made the assumption that they were my spirit guides. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s and asked them, are you my spirit guides? Or no, but we're helping you. I'm like, okay. Perfect. And then they explained who they were. But when I was growing up, they were teaching, like I would find myself at this oval type table and I was normally in a smaller group. So sometimes it would be one on one and sometimes it'd be groups as big as like 12. But normally um, we'd have one or two instructors and it was always very calming and the lighting was soft. And it was like we we're sitting at this like oval table quite often or sometimes we'd be sitting on the floor and looking up at the energy floating in the air. And at first they would show us like the different colors of energy and they explained, OK, well, um, 
um, this kind of like this clarity of color means this, this density means that, this kind shows disease, this kind shows discord, this kind shows um, like higher vibrational, lower vibrational. And from there, they started to show us how the different colors interact with each other. And they explained that energy was all around us. They were the ones who started showing me about auras and how they are like emitted from not only plants to objects to people. And one thing that they started to show us from there was they would show us how to use our hands and how to use our minds to project conscious, almost like um, intention towards these energies that were around us. And they would show us how to use our minds and how to take that pink energy that's directly in like a cloud in front of us and how to get it to swirl, how to get it to blend with the blue, how to make it brighter, how to make it duller, how to um, see how there's that different use and how to change the different properties contained within it. That is what they started to show us how to do. And I remember being absolutely mesmerized by this. I didn't know when I was a teacher that this was energy I was seeing because they weren't leaving the words energy in my mind. They started to give me that aspect of understanding. It was energy as I went towards my late teenagehood, going to like 18, 19. And then as I started to get into 20, I understood that was energy. But they showed how to make it into shapes. And from there, they pushed things like um, Reiki at me for learning. So they said that would be better for helping to verify what I was taught. Same with hands of light. Um, a lot of things like quantum touch just things to understand how to better feel the energy because they were showing us more of the clairvoyant aspect so that was wonderful but even though I was in this craft like this school like setting on craft for years um, it made it a little more challenging in some ways because when I was seeing the energy moving from one state to another when you're on craft, you're actually having an amplified clairvoyant or psychic experience because when you're in the presence of people who are also psychic, um, whether they're earth people or ETs, your psychic ability is amplified because the vibrational frequency in the area is now taken to a higher level. Let's say you were hanging out by yourself, James, and let's say three people join you and none of these people are empathic or psychic to any capacity. They don't see ghosts. They don't see anything. Um, your overall vibration, let's say you're emitting a three and they're emitting a one, well, it will start to settle around a two and theirs will start to go to a little higher than their one point something. Whereas if you were now putting your other people who are emitting at least a three and then you have two instructors that are coming forward that are emitting a five or a six, everyone's vibrational frequency raises, which then increases their psychic ability abilities, allowing for you to see more than you would generally see, perceive, and sense in your day-to-day -day life. And so when a lot of us go on to craft and we're wondering, why am I so telepathic on craft? Why can I create energy balls in my hand? Why can I um, get these downloads of information to a greater extent? It's because our abilities are being amplified by the beings that we're near which is wonderful. But because I was going through this on craft and because I was already going through my MyLab experiences, when the MyLab handlers started to realize that I was going to school on craft, they started to get me to, they were tricking me. And they tried to replicate the classroom that I was in. So when I was with the Pleiadians and I would see these beautiful cream colored walls and things being very like minimalist, but also very love based decor in the sense that like I didn't see paintings on the walls, but and I didn't see like um, lampshades on the lamps and I didn't or I didn't see lamps even, but um, everything felt like it was like everything in its place and everything just completely like serenity is a good way to put it whereas when I went into my my lab hand like handler situations they were trying to mimic that environment I would still have one or two instructors and I would be in a classroom setting where it was like maybe four or five people but the tables were wrong they would have us at other metal tables or wooden tables and the walls would still be gray and the room would be cold and the energy would be cold and they were trying to get us to replicate what we were showing or being shown and what we would show them on craft and what we had learned because they were tricking us trying to make it so that they were um, that we thought we were in the same situation again. Those little dickens. <laughs> for you. So mean. Uh, when, when you found, when you actually found out that or mm -hmm. when you sensed that you're being tricked. Did mm -hmm. you call them on it, or did you just kind of go along with it, not wanting to end up in in my lab jail or something? <laughs> I don't know if there's a my lab jail per se, but you know, I didn't think to call them on it because I was trying to figure out for a while why there were these differences occurring. And once they got a lot of the information they needed, anyways, they switched what program I was in and put me in a different one because I stopped going to school on craft in that capacity around the age of 24. When you say go go on craft. Okay, mm -hmm. let's um, take take my listener for a step back. How did sure. you get on it? 
That's a good question. Sometimes you will find, depending upon the beings, that a portal opens up in the side of your wall and a being will walk through and collect you. Other times an orb will come down through the house and it will expand and take your physical body into it and then take you up onto a craft. Other times you will find yourself um, literally waking up in the night and you will find yourself floating up off your bed going through the ceiling. Sometimes I'll find myself in the middle of the night, like about a month and a half ago, two months ago. I was walking down the stairs completely asleep and I had felt the familiar hum of craft above my house. It's almost like this, like, um, how can I explain it? A vibration that goes like, and consists like, Ooh, 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 type thing. Almost like it's like moving downwards. If that makes sense. Like trying to subtly move. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. And I was completely asleep walking out towards my sliding glass door because normally they have me walk through the sliding glass door when my dog licked my leg. And he woke me up. He took me out of that catatonic state. I walked back up to my bed, laid down, and a minute later found myself outside. It's oh. they, It depends on the beings that are taking you as to how you find yourself going up onto craft. So there's a lot of ways. Interesting, yeah. especially finding yourself outside in your gym jams and <laughs> it's snowing. So. Do you know what? I kid you not, like in September or October of this year, I was so mad at one of my encounters because I was about a block and a half away from my house. I was in a night dress and I'm like, I should not be standing right here on the road. Who put me back in the wrong spot? <laughs> I was so mad. Oh, uh, I would be too, especially that time well, of year. At least it's not like middle of January in a blizzard. And, thank goodness. Uh, and your bare feet. Your dog would be really ticked with you. Somehow. I was barefooted. My feet were dirty oh. when I came home. I'm like, what is this? Because I woke up like again the next time. Like I woke up for a moment, found myself there, saw a UFO that was um, putting one of my neighbors back at this apartment building that's not too far from my house and then went back into a catatonic state and woke up in my bed and I looked at my feet and I'm like, yeah, my feet are dirty. That definitely happened. It was not pleasant. That's crazy. We are talking to Samantha Mowat. Uh, go to her website, samanthamowat.ca. Check her out on YouTube, Samantha Mowat, M-O-W-A-T, and um, an experiencer, um, a Claire everything. <laughs> a manipulator of energy um palladians mm-hmm. i happen to have a palladian living in my house for a while nice no not nice um <laughs> okay that's not nice then. she didn't she didn't know oh uh she actually um she, we were talking to her we we had a clear oh man she had she had dead people with her constantly mm-hmm. driving her crazy one attached himself we had to get that uh, that fellow moved on. Um, she opened a portal up in one of the rooms. We had to, in July, clear nine, not ghosts, but beings out of the room. Uh, a couple of ghosts. Uh, actually, one was a dead relative of mine from the 1700s, which di- he died in the Atlantic Ocean. It was bizarre. Anyway, that's a whole, that's, that's a whole episode, actually. Of, that's <laughs> two, actually, that's two episodes of my uh, podcast is, is dealing with that. Um, but, yeah, we cleared all that out. But we were, we were talking to her through the psychic. She was talking to her said, uh, about these dreams she was having mm-hmm. and a location that she would go to. And she didn't know this was astral traveling. She just knew she'd wake up extremely tired. Mm-hmm. And, but what re- she remembered was a guy would come. Mm-hmm. And she would back out of her body, mm-hmm. and this guy would take her to a place which it had restaurants and beaches and a beautiful ocean. Mm-hmm. It was a seafront area where everybody else seemed to know each other, and everyone was really, really happy. And she'd be there all night, um, hanging out and seeing all her friends and going to the beach and, and sunning herself and the whole bit. And then coming back and, ha- and coming back... Th- through the through the window, mm-hmm. in through the top of her body, mm-hmm. and into her, and, and that was you know a few you know an hour or so later she'd wake up c- completely exhausted, mm-hmm. and that was where she would go. But she had no concept <coughs> of what astral traveling or anything like that was. She didn't oh. know that's kind of what she was doing. When you're when you're doing your Palladian side of things. Have you ever been to a uh, place similar to that at all? Or when you ask to travel, where do you go? Well, I've been to places both physically and astrally. It depends because quite often when I'm asked, well, before I actually get started on this, I need to say one thing. Um, there's a lot of 
multidimensional species racism that I don't agree with. People think, oh, Pleiadian, all good. Well, no, they're just as um, complex as we are. Same with reptilians, same with all the other beings. Um, so we do have to make that well known. So just because somebody says to you, oh, I'm a Pleiadian, don't assume it's in your best interest. Trust your intuition. In fact, she didn't even know she was Pleiadian. It was pointed out to her. And she said, I have no idea what that means. Mm-hmm. And uh, it wasn't like she was coming forward to, hey, I'm a, I'm a part of the <laughs> I'm Palladian. Mm-hmm. No, she wasn't. She, she just like, um, it was being pointed out by a number of uh, beings through a psychic. And that's completely fine. Um, one thing that I, sorry, I have to pour tea because I'm just getting over bronchitis. But um, one thing that I noticed with my encounters is if I'm having a physical encounter, I tend to feel the craft other above the house before I go to bed or I'll feel it throughout the day depends if I'm having a daytime encounter or a nighttime one you normally feel the energy shift within a couple hours before it happens now as to why that is I think it just because they're changing the density around your home or around your tent if you're camping or around your um hotel room if you're in a hotel room whereas with my astral encounters half the time I choose where I go the other half the time I tend to get brought somewhere by somebody else so, for instance, this one time I was astral projecting and I all of a sudden found myself pulled onto this other planet in a different dimensional realm or dimension, I guess. And what I thought was kind of weird, I'm like, okay, it's nighttime, I'm in a city. I'm like, I did not choose to be here. I was trying to go somewhere else. I was trying to talk to my spirit guides. Why am I pulled here? I walk out of this room. I'm walking towards a different one. And this man's in the room and he stops me. He's like, you need to stop for a minute. I'm like, why? Because I put my hand towards the door handles, but to go outside. He's like, there's a man outside. He's looking for you. And he has me bend down. And he has this almost like little secret um, almost like, how can I explain this? Like a little hole in the door so you can look outside and see what's going on. Mm-hmm. And it's in like the lower, like half of the door, maybe even lower third. And he points like, see that man across the road? He's the one who's been asking for him. Like, okay, well, I'm not staying here. Um, when you're astral projecting, you can raise your light body up. You can fly out of the ceiling. You can go to a different planet just by thinking about it. That man who was across the road followed me to the next place I went to. And when he showed up, he wasn't cloaked anymore. And he was several feet away from me. And he was actually a black reptilian. And I looked at him. And, he, and the first thing I thought was, wow, this reptilian is absolutely beautiful. And he was actually decently kind to me. I've seen him several times now. But he wanted to talk to me. And that was why he had pulled me to the location that he was. He was expecting me to show up on the street or much closer, but he didn't quite sense where my energetic signature was when he had pulled me in my astral form to the building across the street from him. So he was trying to use his own energy to discern where it was that I was. Does that make any sense? It, <laughs> does anything make any sense? <laughs> yeah, it does. What was his purpose of wanting to talk to you? Um, he was the one who actually took me to a reptilian world after that. And he was the one who showed me the meat markets and the fact that they have cars and the fact that they actually have, um, kind of like a lot of their properties. Like, you know, when you go to Spanish style homes or you go to like the Middle East or something, how the entire yard has like a large fence keeping the road separate from the property. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, he was explaining to me how on his planet, um, having plants was a sign of wealth. People um, or beings, I guess, um, who had a lot of abundance, a lot of wealth would have trees because you have so much water in such abundance that you can just let it be here for this plant for your visual enjoyment. You have enough water to bathe. You have enough water for everything you need that, oh, look, I have so many plants because I have so much money type thing. And I'm like, okay. And he's told me that if I were to leave his side, that I would be in an incredible amount of danger, that on the this planet it was not safe for me to be stepping away from him and he's actually pointing out because he's sitting on the left side of the vehicle I'm sitting on the right side because we're in the very back and something's um, driving us and he's showing me how these are the different stores and he's explaining I'm like oh okay well can I eat anything here and he's like there's really not much you would enjoy eating because you don't eat meat and I guess he knew that I'm vegetarian or vegan and he was looking at me and he's pointing at the shops and he's like see and I'm seeing like rabbits and like body parts hanging and it's like looking at a butcher shop I'm like oh god that's disgusting he said that is why you are not allowed to leave my side I'm like okay I will not leave your side and he took me to a meeting with a bunch of other beings who were discussing um the meat trade why do you think he brought you there for that 
That is a good question. Um, I've been trying to discern that for a while. Most of the reptilians that I have met have actually been quite respectful towards me. There's only been a few that have been very rude. The reason that I suspect that he has brought me forward has something to do with who my soul is. Um, I'm more of a diplomatic type nature. I don't mean that in an arrogant type way. I think it's just because I'm in contact with a lot of different types of beings. And the fact that quite often the information that I am seeing on Earth, I will be brought up onto large crafts and they will take um, the things that I see, I hear, and I experience on a psychic level. And they will project that information up onto, it's almost like a giant UN type room because they will take the energy and it holographically goes up to the center of this room. Think of like um, something the size of a stadium. And it's projecting upwards for them to all see, feel, and experience at the same time. I think it has something to do with that aspect. Okay. I'm not positive, though. Do all reptilians eat humans? Mm, I don't think all of them do. Some of them seem to enjoy more plant-based foods. Okay. They enjoy more plant-based foods, but, you know, throw a human in every so often, it's not too bad. Well, I mean... Or you they've grown <laughs> away from eating other... I would say beings. some of them have grown away from eating other sentient beings, but I mean, then the same. This is the same thing I tell my kids. Like, if you eat meat, really, what right do you have to judge them for it? You eat cats and dogs and pigs. How is that any different than eating a dolphin, a human, or a bird? I mean, I'm sorry, but what's the difference? Yeah, I would talk to a couple of animal communicators. Yeah. That's my first question I have to to them is, like, so are you a vegan or a vegetarian? And, and both of them said, no, we eat meat. Well, have you ever talked to a cow? And they said, <laughs> yes, we've talked to cows. Mm-hmm. And they understand <laughs> that they're food. And But they both of them say, but pigs, on the other hand, they're like the dolphins <laughs> of the land. We shouldn't be eating pigs. They're extremely... Um, sentient. Uh, sentient, yeah. Uh, but... Yeah, um, chickens and cows. Cows just cows are like um, um, they say like are wild like have the same perception as wild game. If you were going to take me, I understand, mm-hmm. but you have to use every piece of me mm-hmm. and well, respect and and get it over with quick because I know why I'm here and where I'm going to be going after this. So they have some knowledge of that, but pigs are something we shouldn't be going near. You know, it's actually the Palladians that I work with and the Andromedans that I work with that have told me that I'm not allowed to eat any animal products. And the first time I went vegetarian, um, I transitioned easily overnight after an encounter. I went vegan shortly thereafter. And then when I got pregnant, I started eating meat again because that's what my one my first child craved, which is fine. Went back to being vegetarian with my second. But if you... <sighs> If you do want to work with some of these beings, they don't actually like the vibration of us when we have animal products in our body. Because what you're eating, um, and I'm just coming at this from an energetic standpoint, ignoring the environmental, everything else aside, um, when you ingest an animal that has had terror in its lifetime, or it's having, like, let's say um, I'm about to go kill this pig, and it's knowing that it's going to die, and it's terrified, and it left the, spent the entire life in a factory farm. Look at that vibration you're putting in your body. That is discordant. That is fear-based. You can't possibly connect your kundalini and your higher self when you have that much fear-based energy being ingested into your body, now circulating your physical form and your auric field. Good luck talking to your guides well when you have that in your body. They've also explained that I'm not allowed to have things like um, alcohol. I'm not allowed to do things like drugs. They make it so my body doesn't need medications, stuff like that. All the Things that would inhibit the vibration, they keep away from me. So but drink, drink lots of water. A lot of water, a lot of tea. Yeah, that's the big thing um, that I'm finding. I get get told all the time is just drink water, drink more water. <laughs> so, okay, I'm watered out. Dang it! Come on. The mm. um, the one of the interesting points uh, of of the the diet connecting mm-hmm. connecting us to our energies and things is uh, going back. I was had this conversation with a number of people and we were bouncing around. Uh, and, and this is of course coming after the animal communicators were saying, you mm-hmm. know, they, they, if you're going to take the animal, understand it. And it gets back to what you say. It's that fear uh, mm-hmm. growing up in fear. It's like, that's why you don't chase the thing around the, the stockyard with a hammer in your hand. Mm-hmm. You know, it's walking, it's walking through the woods, and boom, there's an arrow in it, and it's dead. Completely different than again chasing mm-hmm. it around. The um, but you thank the animal. Mm-hmm. 
you, you thank it. And for thousands of years, we would thank, thank the animal for giving itself to us so we would move on. And mm-hmm. then, you know, Christianity comes along and we, we move from thanking the animal to thanking God. Mm-hmm. So we were, that was saying grace. <laughs> so basically you're thanking God for giving all the animals and the fruit and the f- vegetables and things. Where back in the day we would just thank them directly. I agree. So, um, so we but, threw a third person in third, and, and we moved <laughs> on. So it, it, it's kind of, it's funny, you know, I was asking him, I said, well, does that, is that to make us feel better? Or is that something that we are supposed to do? But I, th- I think when you actually bless the water you're going to mm-hmm. drink, it's mm-hmm. better for you. Yes, it is. You thank the elements for providing you with the plant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because plants have feelings. Yes, they do. I talk yes. to plants a lot. Just before you eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do talk to my herbs and whatnot. I do play them classical music, and I do tell them what it is I'm going to be using them for. And there's always an exchange. You always have to have everything in perfect balance. Um, because I, I am an animal rights activist, I really do love animals, I made the choice not to eat them. And that's totally fine. I don't judge it. I mean, my husband eats meat. That's his choice. He still chooses to go hunting. I'm like, cool, you do you. I do me. And that's okay. Um, but it's just a matter of you also have to look at your vibrational frequency and what's going on. Because when you have a lot of time where you spend with things like angelic beings and light beings and crystal beings, and it's your job to communicate with these type of beings to get more clarity for other people. That way they can learn about their lives and get on their right path. I have found that having things like animal products in my system, having stimulants like sugar, caffeine, um, alcohol, stuff like that, actually throws off my ability to get a very good, clear read. And so mm-hmm. I can understand why these beings said, no, we don't want you doing this. And I've always found that um, if I was going to do readings, mm-hmm. if I ate a lot of red meat beforehand, mm-hmm. I don't get the reading. The same is if uh, you know, you're out for a beer with the guys and someone says, hey, I got a friend here. You know, could you do a reading? I said, no, I can't. Well, why not? Well, because I'm drinking. <laughs> I'm drinking and so is she. So mm-hmm. it's not it's not like... And, and honestly, when I, a lot of times I am getting something, like their, their guiding being is standing beside them, mm-hmm. usually with their arms crossed, looking at me like... <laughs> like, come on, you could pass that message on, James, what are you doing? It, well, yeah. yeah, he says, oh, come on, or else like, come on, you can read, come on, or else like, <laughs> no, you're not going to. So it's that you have, I reading the person with their, with a the scowl, scowling at me is like... Mm. <laughs> Like, well, I get that a lot. Sometimes I'll see somebody and it, um, they'll have a being beside them and the being is like, no, 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 no. Don't pretend I'm not here. <laughs> because it's, I have nothing to say to the, the the person I'm with and she doesn't really need to know or he doesn't need to know that I'm standing here. I feel like, like, why are you showing me yourself? Oh, because I, I, I'm happy. <laughs> look, at, look at who I'm with. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe, you know, I may bump into the same person a year mm-hmm. later and it'll of happen. Course. But at the time is like, oh, why are you here? And well, uh, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I, was I, funny. I I could get myself thrown into a rubber room, but I could, you know, it is funny to think about, think about those things. You know, I think 50 years ago, we'd both be in rubber rooms, but I think that because humanity is awakening. I mean, even with my clients, I have doctors, lawyers, people that work for NASA. I mean, there's a lot of very scientifically and more conventionally educated people that are looking at these fields going something and this is resonating. I'm going through an awakening process, too, trying to look at the middle ground between the two worlds and seeing where the commonalities are. Yeah, it it is fascinating. And I I keep looking back to, well, my awakening came... Mm -hmm. I guess I've been awake for a long time. It just got pointed out to me in 2012, mm-hmm. um, which hit me right between the eyes when I went to the, see the psychic. And then things <laughs> just over over time have, have really progressed with a couple of timeouts in between. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, there are people out there who are, are starting to open. And I look back at, believe it or not, the, the silly paranormal television shows. Mm-hmm that for 10 or 15 years ago came out and showed idiot uh excuse me people running around a house at night with uh full spectrum cameras uh, Mm -hmm. and tape recorders and every so often getting a voice on it Mm -hmm. that became popular and then that planted the seed in millions of people that there could be something after death 
But that was what was needed at the time. That was where humanity needed to go for our next step. I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, think of where we're going to be in 200 years. This is incredible. What an exciting time to be alive. Well, in 200 years, I will yeah. do that voice on the recorder. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, and there's that. See, because that's opened up the idea that, okay, there's life after death. Oh, by the way, there's psychics, too. <laughs> And the psychics are getting involved in this, and people are now going, oh, so you're psychic? Oh, okay, I've always wanted to have that done. Well, before mm-hmm. it was like, oh, you're psychic? Oh, yeah, you have to get locked up. Well, the psychics then morphed into, oh, you know, a psychic speaks to spirit guides. Well, what are spirit guides? Um, mm-hmm. Some of my spirit guides are ETs. My <laughs> my spirit guide that's still hanging around right now mm-hmm. is Pan. Nice. He's a go I love Pan. Cool. A go-heart is... The little half goat, half human, pan like. <laughs> god, or Greek god of the hillside. Very similar um, to a fawn. Yeah, and that's who who came in and uh, is kind of checking things out right now, for uh, looking after me for a bit now. I have another one. You were talking about your your um, your mm-hmm. path and your con- and your contract. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. And the reason this is a this is personal to me because mm-hmm. I had a psychic. Say you have to get you have a guide that just came through. His name is Narith. Mm-hmm. You need to talk to him because you're off contract. And I well, thought, okay, I don't want to be off the contract like I'm finished because I haven't got my will made up. Um, <laughs> like, and so I was kind of confused. I was a little bit worried that off contract and a finished contract might be the same thing. No, but she said, off- "No, no, you're you're off contract. You have to talk to this guide, and this is mm-hmm. how you need to communicate with him. Mm-hmm. And he is a very, very high vibration. So you ask, have to ask p- for permission to talk to him. And I've tried a few times, and I'm just not getting getting through. But I I, I need to have a discussion with this guy about <laughs> being off contract and how to get back on it. And that's where I'm a little off path now, obviously. Uh, so her term for path and my term." for contract kind of came together mm-hmm. um, as being, and is that how you see it? We're, we are on a path as we, co- we plan to come into this life and your contract is what we've been discussing is to the, to the assistance of the awakening of other humans, basically well, to what's going on. To an extent, um, my original contract for this lifetime, so the one that I had when I first incarnated down here, was to normalize psychic abilities and to be here in more of a healing capacity as well as a teaching capacity. It didn't incorporate the extraterrestrial multidimensional aspect. It was focusing more on the spirit guide aspect and the angelic aspect. However, in 2000. 13, early 2014, I believe, um, I was having an encounter and it was an astral encounter where I was dealing with um, Andromedan beings as well as Archangel Michael. And I had this, so you often will have um, symbols that you will have that'll show you that you have ET craft or ET stuff coming around. So in this case, quite often, if I have a dream where I'm seeing a yellow Volkswagen bug, I know it's a screen memory for a craft. Which sounds ridiculous, but for me, that's just one of them. And I look back in my childhood and I saw this occurring so many times. But anyway, so I saw um, Archangel Michael and he told me that I had to come into this craft, um, change of plans. My contract was changing. And when that happened, um, everything in my life path and contracts changed. So my, um, I was put from just one hybridization program into multiple hybridization programs. Um, that's aware of, I went to now incorporating the extraterrestrial multidimensional component, having to normalize that as well. Um, it changed my relationship contracts for this lifetime, as well as what it was I would be doing and where. Because quite often when you work with spirit guides as well as extraterrestrials and multidimensionals, they will tell you when you're coming up to periods of extreme, like major shifts, and they will warn you one way or another that you're having either new contracts coming into place or that you're off contract, as is in the case of you right now. Um, I would be totally happy for you and I just to speak as friends and for me to talk to your guide and find out exactly what your contract is and what it is you need to do. Just I need it to be in the morning when I haven't had caffeine yet and I've had caffeine today. Okay, so yep. we'll do it soon. Be nice. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, what my contract is, is I'm here to normalize psychic abilities, 
I have hybridization contracts. I have contracts to help to show the diversity of life in this universe. I have contracts in place to make it so that people are able to connect with spirit guides and angelic beings as well as elementals. I have contracts in place with having a certain amount of physical children and a certain amount of hybrid children as well as to have um, certain relationships come into place for me in this lifetime. Those are the major ones that I have right now, as well as contracts to write about a dozen or so books. Which, How many books? Have you got any books out right now? No, I've got one that's two-thirds done, but they have about a dozen that they want done. Oh, so, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully they channel them for you, hopefully. Yeah, um, which is nice. Which, yeah, a friend of mine, uh, after getting a good wonk in the head, she had sat down with a pencil and a pad and looked down mm. at it once. And it was basically a, a letter from her mother in her mother's handwriting telling oh, her about what was going on. She went, oh, okay, beautiful. this is odd. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And uh, my my friend, Akiani Kramerik, an artist, mm-hmm. paints these beautiful paintings. And she says it's just, she just, she's basically sometimes just watching herself paint. Mm-hmm. And they, they, yeah, she's crazy good doing paintings. <laughs> um, I can do Samantha Mowat. Go to her website, samanthamowat.ca. Uh, check out all the things that she can do for you and all the things that she, she does. And also check her out on YouTube. Um, please subscribe to her YouTube channel. Just Google Samantha Mowat YouTube. It'll get you there. Samantha, uh, we're coming up to the end, and I've got so much more to talk to you about. Um, really quickly, and... Uh, this is, is something to really quickly. This will take an hour. Uh, the uh, do you have any events that you're coming to? Or no, you, it's really hard for you because you're a mom and you can't really just bounce around where, piggly piggly wherever you can. Yeah, do you, do you go to um, no this so? year. I do. And this year's a nice break off. Um, My guides warned me that this year is a lot of personal stuff happening for me. Um, Probably one of the most turbulent personal years. They told me next year things are going back to where they're supposed to be. But this year is focusing on myself and family. So I'm abiding by that. Yeah. And I'm getting that. uh, This is me getting weird things, too. Mm -hmm. I'm getting that you uh, this is a recharging year. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is basic. It's it's turbulent. Um, challenges are put in our path Mm -hmm. to learn from Mm -hmm. and this is a learning year which is exciting I'll take it yes oh of course because you you know what the the good thing about being who you are Mm -hmm. is you know you're coming out of it at the end okay (laughs) so it's like it's like other people walk in and go oh my god me and my house burnt down and not that your house is going to burn down (laughs) you know or you know my goldfish died I'm I don't know what to do well at least you know at the end of it it's oh this is all for a reason and everything's going to be twice as good when we're finished this so So, funny thing you say that they did warn me that my house could burn down from a forest fire this year depending upon how things go and i do have a goldfish that's where you're going oh no i'd forget the goldfish so (laughs) that's funny (laughs) okay so i shouldn't have said either of those things um yeah you're that whole forest fire thing i know i was uh in august uh, a couple of years 2017 in august i was riding mm-hmm. my motorcycle down th- from vancouver british columbia to portland and then mm-hmm. left turn eastbound to sturgis south dakota mm-hmm. and it was smoky the entire mm-hmm. route and about 100 degrees Ooh. Um, and when i got there I, I, I went to my friend uh seth and brian who lives down in, in portland mm-hmm. and who, who was the first human being i spoke to <laughs> because I was breathing in smoky air the whole way, my yeah. my vo- vocal cords were shrunk up. So I was talking like this. Seven, <laughs> how are you? It's like <clears throat> seven. How are you? It's like, I, uh. but uh, yeah, it was it was bizarre that we're getting this much fire. Um, but forests are made to burn. That's what they're supposed to do. Eventually, mm-hmm. uh, they're supposed to cleanse. Uh, unfortunately, we humans we love to be close to them and build our houses in the middle of them. So, um, yeah, make sure you have all your belongings in a nice fireproof. I do. <laughs> good. And uh, same with the kids. Put a little sprinklers mm-hmm. on them and uh, that'll be good. And pay attention to the dog because he'll know when it's coming. The uh, it, it It's a fascinating life. You have... Samantha, I almost called you Sam. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, Samantha, and uh, it, it's really very, very nice to talk to you again. And I would like, I'm definitely going to hit you up on the offer of uh, checking my my 
in with my spirit guide to find out what the heck is going on and where I am on mm -hmm. my path. And I do also want to talk to you one day about um, the the more of your clairvoyance and your psychic abilities and, and how that... Um, that part of you works. Uh, <laughs> that works. Uh, but the, the the ET side of things, my gosh, um, it's fantastic. And uh, the information that you have is it needs to get out there. It really does. And I'm I'm not going to sleep tonight because I'm going to think I'm going to get eaten by a reptilian. <laughs> but uh, no, please don't be afraid of that. Honestly, I wouldn't be afraid. Oh yeah, it's only those other billions of people that are being eaten. It's not you. Uh, well, <laughs> you're not in one of the places that they said they were going to be harvesting from. Oh, okay. So, what? Like, I'm not worried. Like, like I will tell that. you off camera where they told okay. me they were going, but I'm not telling you on. Okay. Uh, Alrighty. Uh, that'll get everybody really excited. Um, so if, if you want to know that from Samantha, you have to sign up for one of her court. No, I'm kidding. Um, but again, go, go to Samantha's website, samanthamowat.ca. Please um, Google her and check out the YouTube. Subscribe to her YouTube channel, uh, Samantha Mowat, and hear what she has to say. She's a wonderful human being. And uh, thanks a lot for coming out. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Watching you while you sleep all alone All right, that's it. Let's roll. And hey, 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 hey! Let's be careful out there. Far over the snow.